Well, thank you. This is um, this is like the mecca, so it's incredible to be here. Um, so I actually was here about ten years ago, twelve years ago, and to to have the name of of Crowley Lecture is an incredible honor because this is really one of the places that got my career started. Um, the key to success is to not be smart, but copy the people that are smart. And that's all I've done my whole career. And I, I saw this concept of an inguinal hernia being done laparoscopic here uh, at Stanford. And it was Craig Albanese. I flew here. He showed me how to do it. And that became the research focus for the rest of my career. Um, and so to be here under the name of Crowley and at Stanford is incredibly meaningful to me. All right. So James had mentioned Global Past MD. This is a company that I own, and the story of owning that company actually is very helpful to what I'm trying to do now, which is how to innovate in a, in a, in a Midwest uh, nonprofit organization that's not really entrepreneurial minded. Globalcast started because when I was at Rainbow Babies trying to uh, do virtual training, the hospital said, you can't do that. We're not paying for any of that. Start your own company. So I did. Uh, it's, it's made a total, of, I've made a total of zero dollars in 12 years, but the company has allowed me to be nimble and it allows the hospital to have a new co within the hospital to allow us to say, okay, the hospital's got too much bureaucracy if we go that way, but let's do it through this company. So by having a little company within a company, has allowed us to do things we never would have been able to do. I can hire an editor without going through six months of HR. I can do whatever I want because I can be much more nimble in a small company. And that model, we're trying to grow even more throughout the organization by having more NUCOs like that, it's little separate companies. I don't know, do those exist here? Are there companies within the hospital? Because it's a very cool thing to do. Here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about how to stay updated with new medical knowledge. This is what we do. Who does this? These are the three things. Raise your hand if you believe that these are the ways that you stay updated in new information. Sort of, okay, sorry. Textbooks, journals, and sites. You would agree, right, that these are the three main ways. So I will say today, and this is blasphemy to a lot of true academics, that this is nonsense. And these three things will not be the way that we're truly gonna get information in the future. They're important. All three of these are important, but they're not gonna be how our new information is gonna to get to us. They used to work. And I'm gonna show you why none of these are effective anymore. So let's start off with societies. Here's what happens. This guy has an amazing discovery. He just discovered some incredible cure to something. And he wants, all he wants to do is tell the world about it. That's all he wants to do, scream from the rooftops and tell everyone about this. So what does he do? What do we do when we have an incredible discovery? We go and present at a society meeting. Okay, that's perfect. Now this guy lives in Canada. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna go to the Canadian society and present to the Canadians. And who is gonna see this discovery? The Canadians. And this happens all over the world. For some crazy reason, medical, new critical medical information is presented regionally. Still in 2023, you present it where you live. Even if they have a world Congress, it's still at a given place and it's only however many hundreds of people see it. So there's a problem with disparities in what information we see. So we talk about healthcare disparities and yes, some of it is because there's financial disparities, but I would argue that our, what our lab started 12 years ago is our mission was that medical knowledge should be equal everywhere. Fine, you may not have a robot, but there should be no difference in what you know, depending on where you live. That was what we were trying to do is equalize medical knowledge. So what about journals? Journals are great. All the new information is presented there. Here's the problem. You publish, Did anyone publish anything this year? Okay, yeah, I knew you would raise your hands. All right. The day that that came out, the journal, the month it came out, you wanted everyone to see this incredible article you published. Here's the problem. When that got published, so did all these. Because now we have so many journals and so many publications. It used to be you had one journal, you would open it, you read it. Now you've got 15 journals and you're given sub, sub, sub specialty. There's too much. It's camouflaged. So now it's absolutely impossible to know what to pay attention to. There's too much information. In fact, if you look at the growth curve of medical publications, 
this is the curve. It's, it, this is the shape of an exponential growth curve. When something goes exponentially grow, it starts like this and then it shoots up, okay? So it used to be that in the 1950s, well, I'm gonna minimize the zoom thing here. In the 1950s, if you looked at how often it would take for something to double for our medical knowledge that you're supposed to be aware of, it would take 50 years. And then because it's an exponential growth curve, it went in 1980, it went to seven years. That's how long it would take for the amount of information you're supposed to know doubles every seven years. And then in 2010, it went to 3.5 years. Every 3.5 years, that's how long it takes for it to double. And now it's 73 days. The amount of information as a doctor you're supposed to know doubles every 73 days, okay? And it's funny because medical school is still four years. Now, how are we supposed to learn it all in four years? So who's heard the story of the king and the chessboard? You know, you've heard it a hundred times, okay. So I just talked to you that medical information is doubling and it's exponentially growing. And you say, so what, that's a lot. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a guy who invented a chessboard. It's an amazing game. He invents the game of chess. He takes it to the king of India and the king of India says, oh my God, this is the best game ever. How can I repay you? The man says, I'm a simple guy. I don't want money. I want rights. And the king says, all right, how much rice do you want? He goes, well, I got to feed my family. So let's, do, let's play a game with my chessboard. Put one grain of rice on the first square, then two, then four, double it up, go across the whole board. I'll take it home to my family. King says, no problem. And he puts one and two and four. And he says, this is the second row. He goes, uh-oh, this is a problem because a big number, when it doubles, becomes a really big number. And then the whole room they're in starts filling up with rice. The whole palace starts filling up with rice. And the whole country of India fills up with three feet of rice. And finally, he finished covering up the chessboard. That's exponential growth. That's why the curve shoots up. And that is what's happening to the amount of information that's becoming available for us to be paying attention to. So good luck, because you need to know it all, okay? Otherwise, you're just behind the times. 18 quintillion, by the way. Finally, textbooks, okay? So we talked about societies, regionalized, journals, no filter, too much information, predatory journals, this is too much. What about textbooks? They're good, right? I mean, the textbooks, we use those, that's the fundamentals, the foundation of what we learn. Here's the problem with textbooks. They used to be good, they're okay now, because we talked about exponential growth curve. Here's another way to look at knowledge, okay? IBM predicts knowledge in general doubles every 11 to 12 hours. So a book was published, write a book chapter, then, Things change. It's a story of all the different publications. So the, in, the, in the next decade, there's been a lot more publications. It's time to rewrite the book chapter. So you rewrite the book chapter, and then you rewrite the book chapter, and you rewrite it. And that works before. But if you're going to rewrite book chapters when a substantial amount of change happens, you should be writing it about every 15 minutes. Because that's about, there's just no way that you can write textbooks frequently enough to keep up with substantial change. I'm not talking like a little change. I'm talking like it's outdated by the time it's published. So that doesn't work. So I don't either. So, so this was the, this was, remember that growth curve. This was the, this was my father's generation, right? It was still exponentially growing, we saw, but he was on the first half of the chessboard. So when he started his career and he ended his career, he pretty much was able to keep up. Go to a society meeting, read your journal, read a textbook, he was able to keep up. This is us. So anyone who says, yes, just read the textbook and go to the society, they don't understand because they had a different part of the chessboard than we do. We have a different world now and we have to adapt and say, all right, if we're going to stay current and know that we're doing things in our hospital the right way, that we know how to deal with pneumomediastinum, that we're doing it the right way, and what other, this is, you're going to have to come up with some other way because those other things aren't going to work. So this is the question. How do we do it? How do we take ridiculous amounts of information? Some of it is really important that changes and comes out every day. How do we get that into a busy head? This is my answer. Who's seen Matrix? 
This is what we're going to do. You're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to say, here's pediatric surgery, have some coffee, get a little pediatric surgery in your head. And then you just, you know, you know, your day's amount of pediatric surgery. <laughs> That's the answer. Now, I used to have this on here purely as a joke. It still is. But some of you may have seen that there are companies doing this, right? So billionaire no. entrepreneur Elon Musk has launched a new startup which will work to implant artificial intelligence technology into the human brain. The ultimate goal of this company is to merge man with machine, fusing human intelligence with artificial intelligence to bring humanity up to a higher level of cognitive reasoning. Musk has been calling this brain-computer interface technology Neuralace. In essence, Neuralace is an ultra-thin mesh that is implanted into the skull and forms a body of electrodes which are able to monitor brain function. Neuralace should enable humans to upload or download information directly from a computer. Uh-oh. <laughs> Coming. So I, I do think that would be, if there was some way, like people, I'm, I don't read that fast. And people give me these books and they're like, oh, read these four books. And it, it, there's just no way. I wish there was some way I could just put it in there. Um, I do audio. That doesn't help, though. All right. So then uh, a, a cardiologist named Anthony Chang, he mentioned this book, and it's called Harnessing Our Digital Future. And I read this book. Speaking of slow reading, it probably took me longer than most. I read this book, and this is what we based our strategy on, on how do we use new technology to better spread knowledge around the world. So I'm going to go through the three categories in this book, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing that they talk about is machine. Machine may be one of the ways that we get knowledge, make sense of all this knowledge. So we're talking about machine learning. I don't have to, in the last decade, I don't have to talk about this anymore. Everyone knows AI now. So the idea is that we teach the computer to learn on its own. And, but we do want to talk about NLP and the idea of applying natural language processing to this problem of medical knowledge overload. So this is a brief video of Google's solution to the duplex that if you want it, has anyone seen this video where if you want to make a haircut appointment and you tell your phone, please make me a haircut appointment tomorrow at 10 a.m., this is what happens behind the scenes within the phone. Has anyone seen this? Yeah, I'll play it. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, so... What we wondered was, we saw this video in our lab, and we said, can we do this to help us solve this problem? Can we use NLP to figure out how to solve this information overload? So what we did in our tiny little specialty of pediatric surgery is we said, can we teach the machine to predict a paper that would get accepted or rejected? In other words, how do we determine good? Now, that's a whole other set of worms, can of worms, is how do we know that the editorial boards of these societies or these journals are correct, but we at least wanted to see is could we teach the machine to predict if the editorial board would accept or reject or basically say this is a good paper, this is a bad paper? And could the machine eventually, each morning when I wake up, say this is a good paper, this is a bad paper, at least to help filter for me? So what we did is we took 520 abstracts, which is a very small number, and we got an 85% negative predictive value, meaning the machine was able to predict 85% of the time when a paper would get rejected by the APSA editorial board. So the uh, data scientist said, if you can give us one more set of 520, we could get it up to 95%. So the question is, 
this is cool. How would you feel if your paper got rejected by a machine? I don't know, that's a separate question, but we are being able to figure out filters to be able to filter through junk versus important information. So that brings us to the second one, which is platform. When I talk about platform, it's about how are people getting information now? And what we noticed 12 years ago was that not only are people consuming media for entertainment, they're using it for information, but we are not good at that in healthcare. How can we use what mainstream does and use media in a powerful way to teach the world to end disparities in medical knowledge so we can disseminate information using media? And not only that, people don't want long videos. They want 30 seconds. They want a minute. My kids won't even watch a full-length movie anymore. They want short, concise information. So can we, instead of using the traditional mechanisms, start using more modern mechanisms like audio, video, and social media? And I will tell you that to, to, to bring this point home, if somebody goes to the emergency room and sees this child sick and they don't know what to do, I can tell you where they're not going to go to find the answer. They're not going to go here. Right? They're not going to go to a library. What they're going to do is they're going to go to their phone. Right? We know that over 75% of doctors at one point in the day use a Google search to find an answer. At some point, they're searching on their phone for something. So why don't we embrace that and get better information on the device so that we have trusted information um, on search engines? So given that we know that people like media, we started this initiative of trying to convert important medical information into media. You know who's done this well is History Channel. They're able to take in, in, important history and make it engaging. Hamilton made important information and made it engaging. Can we do the same with medicine? Can we make it kind of a little fun so that people actually watch it? So we created this thing we call the Education Engine, where we take an article, maybe boring, it doesn't matter. We take an article that has been determined to be important or sentinel article, and we put it through our engine with this team of about eight people. And we come up with a very uh, thought out media, a form of media, and we disseminate it to every possible channel around the world to make sure that we can reach the globe. So this is our, this is what we've been doing now for a decade. And um, we make TikToks, we make animations. We, and by the way, TikTok, I know James talked about TikTok. The, the lab uses TikTok not to like disseminate necessarily on TikTok, but the idea that they have perfected is a easy to make, short, concise video that has a lot of information. So for someone who's really busy, you could make a video using that as your video creator in a very short amount of time. And when we're really busy, that's efficient for us rather than going on some fancy video editor on your computer. So here's an example of a video. This is one of the first ones we made about what you're supposed to wear in the operating room to operate. So this was the video. Today we're going to address a hot topic of debate in the operating room, which is the safest headgear to wear in the operating room. Is it this? Is it this? Or is it this? Well, this question was just answered in so a this recent is the video. study called Hats Off, a study it was of funny different because operating room headgear. We, a... we did this video. And this was when we were like, oh, there's something to this because my fellow went and presented at our big uh, society meeting and there was like a hundred people in the room and this got 50,000 views. We're like, okay, so this is probably a better way to send out messages. We just have to make sure we do this responsibly and we get good messages out there. So people like engaging, they like short. And so here's the problem. I don't have much time to be making these complex videos all the time. Look what actually went into making this video. You got me, I have no, I'm not good on camera, so. <laughs> okay. Is it this? <laughs> so how many of us are able to truly take time out of our day to do this? It's, it's not very easy. So we started coming up with tricks to make it easier. We said, what if I just give you audio so I can talk into my phone when I'm doing something else, I don't have to be on camera, and we take that and we convert it into a cartoon. That way, we're constantly looking for ways to get ideas from people that have something to teach, that don't have the time to do it, so we're, we're trying to use this. This is an example, just my Here's voice. Here's an article you should know about. 
In the August 2019 issue of JPS, Here's Ron Gard et al. looked at the recurrence rate of benign ovarian tumors in children. From the... We actually invited the world to do this, and we got people from every country just sending us their voices, and we were putting them to cartoons. And maybe that's a way to do it. So we're always trying to teach. Now, this one's fun. So watch this video. Again, looking for efficiency, how busy clinicians can make important new information. This is becoming the new podium, by the way. Like if you want to reach the masses, if you do it responsibly, this is the way to reach people. So here's a video. Watch it for a minute. This is to, for patients about inguinal hernias. I'll play like maybe 30 seconds of it, and then we'll talk about what actually happened. Hello, my name is Todd Ponsky, and I'm a pediatric surgeon. And today I'm here to talk to you about pediatric inguinal hernias and the surgical options available for treatment. What is an inguinal hernia? An inguinal hernia oh. is a condition where a part of the intestines bulges through a weak spot in the abdominal wall, specifically in the inguinal area. In children, All right, now, this video, I woke up in the morning, I typed in to chat GPT, <laughs> write a script for a patient on inguinal hernia. This entire thing was written by chat GPT. I went in front of, I, I have a, I've paid, I think, like $20 for an app that does a teleprompter. I read what it said, sent it to an editor that we, so, so there's, that's a whole nother thing, but you can get editors um, at more, at affordable rates. So it's not breaking the bank for the hospital. And the editor is then able to, within probably, I think it was like two hours, put this video together. So came up with the idea in the morning, using stock footage from the internet, we were able to make this video in a few hours. So we're getting better at, at not letting time be a constraint on getting medical information to the world. What we think is the future is the next video. Now this is creepy, but I went to this, the consumer electronics show and I saw this concept of, this is using deep fake to make videos. So what we're going to do is take videos of all of our surgeons, all of our faculty, use AI to help start a script, send it to them, make sure they approve it, and we can make videos at scale. Now this one has no, uh, this is a robotic voice, but the idea is it's all fake. This is uh, all made by AI. Hey, this is Todd Ponsky. <laughs> well, not really. I am actually just an AI clone of Todd Ponsky. <laughs> all I did was type in a script and this video was created. <laughs> this is a peek into the future of how just enter. So, uh, it's scary. <laughs> but, but again, as we look for efficiency, we have to be careful we're responsible about it. So where do we keep all this information? We put it all over social media and then we put it in a platform because people said, the problem is I want to go back and refer to that. So we said, all right, we'll make an app. We call it Stay Current. We put all the information into this app. But then Mira Kodigal, one of the surgeons at the hospital at Cincinnati said, I love this. Everyone uses it. It's got all this great information. But what about our own hospital protocols and guidelines that we do at our hospital? So she said, can I have our own private space where we have the stuff I use every single day, our handbook, our phone numbers, our protocols, our guidelines, everything we do, our videos, our lectures, our educational content. Great. So we said, no problem. And we made her a space. So here's the main app. It's got all the stuff from all over the world, from different people that have put good stuff. But if she scrolls over to Cincinnati Children's, this is their own private space. And it's got all of their stuff, their trauma protocols and guidelines. They've got, um, uh, it can have links to up to date. It could be whatever you can aggregate, whatever you want. And she, it's all in here. So I'll skip ahead because it's, it shows, but it's, it's a very robust thing and, and they use it every single day. And then they can put things from the societies or whatever they want in there. Then we made these things called collections where it's by disease and it's a collection from wherever it's some of their stuff stuff from our society, stuff from the journal, and it's all aggregated together by disease. So this was another thing that they did. Now what happened was we made this for them and Katie Russell is a pediatric surgeon at Intermountain Health said, hey, we heard about that, can we have that? We said, sure, no problem. So we made a space for Intermountain Health. And before I get to the next slide, I wanna ask you a question because then I'm gonna get to the next slide. 
if you were on who wants to be a millionaire and you didn't know this answer, would you do 50, 50, would you phone a friend or would you ask the audience? So who here would do 50, 50? One person who here would phone a friend. Okay. Who here would ask the audience? Okay. So if you do 50, 50, your chances of getting it right are 50%. If you call an expert, your chance of getting it right is 66%. If you ask a completely uninformed audience, your chances of getting it right are 91%. The crowd, we don't give enough credit to the crowd. The crowd is almost always right, depending on the question you ask. And we don't use that enough in medicine. We have these core of experts that we trust to write a textbook or whatever, instead of asking the massive crowd to come together to, to write the world's textbook. So the number, the third thing is crowd. So that's the third thing. And this is, we already talked about a king, we talked about Elon Musk, and here's the ox. Francis Galton takes an ox to the state fair. He asks everyone, how much does this ox weigh? He asked 800 people, and the average guess was 1,197 pounds. The actual weight of the ox was 1,198 pounds. This experiment has been reproduced over and over again. Planet Money just did the same thing. The crowd will almost always give you the correct answer. And we don't do that in medicine. We, we think we need to trust this core of experts instead of asking everyone to, to write the book together. So we have created this concept. That, that, I don't, oh, sounds... So here's the concept that's gonna rub people the wrong way, but we think this is gonna be the future. We added one little button and it's this door. Now, what does a door do? A door allows one hospital to have a door into another hospital. Let's start sharing. Why are we separate from each other? Let's embrace the crowd. Let's bring everyone together to write the book together. So what happened was now, a ton of hospitals are coming together and they're choosing to join this network to create a space of their stuff and allow other hospitals to peek inside their door and see what's going on. There's a lot of controversy with this, a lot of ground rules. How do we do this the right way? How do we know that when something is good or they're just popular? If, how do we determine that? If, if one hospital changes their guideline on a treatment plan and everyone starts using that, is that good or is that just popular? So we're trying to figure it out and not everybody wants to share everything. Some hospitals say, no, we're gonna keep this close to our chest. My answer is why? Why wouldn't you share absolutely everything? And so far they are, they're sharing lectures, they're sharing guidelines and protocols and you get notified when something has changed or something is trending. So it's a new idea of bringing the world together to write the book together. So this is, people talk about the textbook of the future. I think the textbook of the future is not just an online textbook. That's just the same thing online. The future of the, the future textbook is that it's created by the world and curated by the crowd. So this is the, the issue about access disparities. I think that by doing this, we can end disparities. So in summary, the traditional methods of knowledge delivery are becoming less relevant in the era of exponential growth. Filtration and dissemination of new medical knowledge will rely on machine learning and entirely new platforms, and the crowd may work together to write the modern day textbook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. Food for thought. Um, anyone has a question in the audience, um, you just raise your hand and we'll use the microphone. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Really, really, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I've seen you give similar talks over the years, and I, just the way that this has evolved and how you've used Cincinnati and Globalcast as um, really an experiment. And it's, it's just been really impressive to see. So we had some great questions. Not shockingly, the first one is chat GPT related. Um, so someone says they believe it needs to be ver uh, verifiable to build trust. And how do you build trust with a... NPL. Right. So the, the, the most that's this is the most common question. And I unfortunately don't have that answer yet. So we are that's why it's our lab, um, because we believe there is a power or a strength in using some element of artificial intelligence, how we check it at the door. I don't know. <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> we've all seen or heard about the incredible um, problems that come with AI. I mean, I, AI can be taught to be biased, can be taught to be racist, anti-Semitic, everything. So I don't know how we're going to responsibly do that. I rely on uh, people smarter than myself. I can tell you that um, we're just in the early phases of trying to validate the AI. So when something comes out and we're saying, okay, this is in alignment with other methods of determining good, um, it part of this also has to be used in conjunction together. The crowd plus a, sorry, excuse me, the crowd plus AI, maybe with an editorial board. That's how Wikipedia works. Wikipedia isn't just the crowd. It's the crowd plus an editorial board. There's no AI yet, but I think probably a mix of all these together is going to give us the, the most likely correct answer. I think we have. Question from Dr. Axelrod, go ahead. Hey, I'm David Axelrod, I'm in pediatric cardiology. Thanks for your talk. Um, I think it's also incumbent on us when we're talking about the crowd and um, TikTok and kind of all of these very um, user-friendly apps to also think about kind of the shadow side of that, which is that like we can't talk about disseminating good information if you don't also talk about people on tip TikTok disseminating ivermectin. Right. information right That's we're right. just recently one of the biggest tiktokers on that ended up dying of complications and right so like this is a huge responsibility yeah. um and I, I guess your thoughts on that like how do you what the you know peer review is an important part of the journal publishing process there's tons of negatives with it yep. and it's also biased but but there are parts that it prevents absolute trash from getting yeah it often prevents absolute trash from getting public <laughs> Okay, so the ivermectin example is exactly why we have to do this. Because you know what? We got beat. Let's just call it as it is. The misinformation people beat us. The good information, we sat back, we're quiet, we're saying, yeah, this is nonsense. Where were we? Why aren't we playing in this game? If the world is seeing this information and who's really selling it out there are the wrong people, that's because we as a medical community are still going to a society meeting, standing at the podium, instead of embracing modern ways of disseminating our story. That's my answer to that. I think we really did not come to the plate when it was time for us to do so. I'm gonna take one online and then we'll go to Dr. Brazzoni. So um, <clears throat> there was a question about, yeah, sexism, racism. I think you, you, you touched on that. Um, how, one question is, um, this is an interesting one. Does your institution, you personally have medical legal coverage for videos? So this is a complicated question. One of the parts, I tried to cut this talk short, which I could show, but um, the other element of what we do is, is using video for telepresence and, and trying to spread technique knowledge around the world by being present in the operating rooms. Um, when we talk about telling stories, the question is who's checking to make sure that the stuff I'm doing is okay to be sending out there. Some of the hospitals we're working with, and I'm not gonna mention them, are much more risk averse about their, their clinicians putting information out on the internet. And my answer is, are you checking to make sure there's stuff that they're submitting to a journal or a society or a textbook chapter? Are you checking those too? It's just one more platform. So yes, it has much more visibility, but I don't remember them ever looking at my talk for the American College of Surgeons and saying, how does that look? So bigger audience, same idea though. You have to, you have to just see if you trust your doctor, your, your staff to be putting good information out. So no, there's never been, there was one potential legal thing that happened and that there was a, someone called me that there was a lawsuit on someone who uh, did something laparoscopically and the patient got injured and they were using our videos to show the standard, what they did wrong. They're saying they should have done this. When the surgeon called me, their point was, you very easily could have been brought in the other way, that something went wrong and they're saying, look, I copied your video, it's your fault. And my answer is, it's still no different than a publication I put out there. I mean, we put out these, all of us in this room, a lot of the surgeons in this room, we put publications of very new techniques that are early and potentially, you know, haven't been studied for many years and those aren't scrutinized. So why is this different? And that, by the way, come back at me if this is a discussion. I mean, you guys are all probably 10 times smarter at this stuff. 
If someone has a different opinion, tell me, because this is where we learn about this. Does anyone disagree with that idea that it should be okay to put stuff out there? No one? The paper you got right or that's saying this seems pretty valid. Yep. Whereas any quack can ever on TikTok. So let me ask you, this is I'm gonna ask for your help. Last last night, and in fact, Matias, you were just talking about these incredible videos you saw from Egypt, those videos. We don't have a review process. You know what the review process is? I go, oh, this looks good. Let's put it in. Right. So we probably need, as I just said before, an editorial board. Now, I'm going against what I said because I believe the crowd is the best editorial board. Have you heard of Social Science Research Network, SSRN? Malcolm Gladwell says it's his famous favorite website. This is an amazing journal, Social Science Research Network, with no editorial board. The, all the articles get published and the crowd decides which ones rise to the top. It's all crowd-driven, zero editorial board. Probably it's a combination of both. You need the crowd plus an editorial board. So that's probably what we need to do. Yeah. 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 Which, originally, which I would never get in. Which is, yeah. which is evolved over time, but yeah. there is, it's plus one or plus one. Right. So it's not about the value of what the science is. It's just about that the science was done soundly and it's, um, it's done in a robust, rigorous, reproducible way. And then it's published, and the idea is that the crowd will decide the value of it or the impact of it or the adoptability of it, which is kind of a little bit of peer review, but it's, it's trying to change the model from we're the experts and we say what needs what should be published, Wait. what should be consumed, as opposed to let the crowd decide once we agree that it's within a certain standard. Who's the crowd? So, so the article, no, I'm asking, so hold on. So the article gets published, and then it goes to who, who decides that it gets to go in the journal? The same as SSRN, it's literally all the readership. There is a vetting process, which is the readership is part of the editorial process, right? To say, yes, this is reasonable. Okay. Put it out there and let people decide. I mean, I, I think we are hitting on what is probably the most important question to ask. As, as information becomes more voluminous and more crowd so inserted information without... If, it used to be I could only get stuff out there if it went through peer review. Now I know that I can get my stuff seen if I don't go through peer review, that 50,000 or 100,000 people will see my video if I go through social media. If I send, so if I want to get my stuff known, that's the route I'm going. I don't want to go through a journal or society where six people will see it. I want to go where 100,000 people will see it. But that doesn't have a review process. So the question is, that the big question we have to answer is, how do we mar marry the two? How do we get massive viewership and distribution with a responsible oversight or filtration process, a review process. Yeah, yeah so, so clearly everybody asked the same question. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, yep. so I think that's the hot topic. And I, I, I congratulate you. I, I see every video you get out there and, and I look at the abstracts or, or the summaries of what you present. And I think for, like, you have to be a very educated reader or listener to take what you want to take. I think to me, to be a devil's advocate, you could, you know, people could turn a little bit lazy with this method. I, I, I do agree. It has to be out there. If I try to think back at every, every single journal club, which is one of the more sort of local massive dissemination tools we, we've had, right? Yeah. So journal club, ever since medical school fellowship, residency fellowship, residency today, years of faculty, if I really try to see which paper really sort of changed practice or was not criticized as there's no powers, retrospective, I don't trust who published it, that hospital doesn't do well, this is like you can't repeat it. Yep. It's just I can count them probably with one hand. Yeah. Like if I try to think back for 30 years of journal club, right? Yep. So I don't know. To me, that's another thing. Maybe with the message of the videos, it's like, hey, go check it out. Or, or try to validate for yourself, or maybe a message that says, this is what these authors say, which is quite interesting. Why don't you go check it out and uh, maybe just get into it. So maybe disseminate a culture of get involved, read on it. This is just a little bit of a wake up call for you to see something. Because I, I think people will tend to like get lazy, right? Let's just see the 30 second video and we're done. Let's go do that operation. So not only do you think we've, Studied that. <clears throat> we took three types of media. 
we took, we started dispense, dispersing just the title. That, it's an RSS feed from the journal. So the journal pushes out the titles, that's it. Phase two, an infographic. So it's summarized as an infographic. Phase three, a video, a 30 second, one minute video that summarizes the video. We looked at two pieces of information, engagement and click-throughs to read the article. All of them had the link to the article. The more boring and the less we said, the less engagement. It was like almost very little engagement with like a 90% click-through rate. The more engaging we made it, everyone wanted it. Highest engagement, the lowest click-through rate. People felt satisfied that they saw this 30 second, one minute video. And what I would say to defend that is, they're a minute smart, they are smarter now than before they saw it. They know about how to treat pneumomediastinum. They did not before. They didn't validate it. They didn't go and read the article. They're trusting the source. They're saying, well, so, and then we debate, I think we're more like headline news and not CNN. We only tell you this, that the, the, we have, we want to do it in a minute. We're saying, check this out. This is the thing. This was what it, the abstract said, read the article. And then maybe it's the comments from people on how, like the journal club, but basically people saying this is a you know junky article, whatever. I don't have, I don't know the answer, but we're learning what's going on right now. We have to perfect it. I'm just going to take a, a one online and we'll go to Dr. Sylvester. Um, um, much, but I, I would say congratulations. I should have said at the beginning, this is really compelling. You can tell by the conversation that it's engaging to people. Thank you. And Keep going, man. This is fantastic. <laughs> but there's two different aspects of this. One is how you're getting it out there in short video feeds, which is which is great. And the fact that you have metrics, which was what I was going to ask you, you want to answer that. Yeah. The other part is what's I think other people are asking and still discussing or trying to wrestle with is okay, you, but you're taking material that's already been peer reviewed or accepted and making it consumable. Correct. Versus what's actually should be consumable. That sorry, can I just real quick? So so that's a great point. What we've been putting out is every, well, that's not true. What we started off by putting out was everything that was already peer reviewed. Now we're summarizing lectures. So uh, Lurie Children's just gave us 10 grand round lectures. They know no one will ever go watch again, right? And we're making them into three or four or five minutes for them, right? Um, and Children's National. And, and since, so now you have reputable institutions. So Children's National, Northwestern, Cincinnati Children's, where you have a reputable person giving a reputable lecture and we're summarizing that in five to seven minutes or something. Now we're, we're still thinking we're reputable and okay, but we're not as reputable as when it was peer reviewed. So we're sort of creeping away from only using peer reviewed stuff. It's, it's, this is where I love, I mean, to be totally honest, I get this, I, everything we do is when I talk with people like you guys is how we refine what we do because we're not sure how to do it yet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just there's one one online question. I want to take this one, and then we'll probably uh, wrap up. So online, there was a question. They they said that you know, in essence, pub, uh, presenting at a society is asking the crowd because you get live feedback as you're getting right now. Yeah. But how it, it feels like when you blast something out to 100,000 people, you're not really able to get the crowd feedback. And you mentioned comments. Yeah. But but how do you think about that? How do you get sort of valid feedback from the crowd to either uprank something, downrank it, or whatever. Yeah, we're not good at that yet. Right now, we basically rely on comments. And if something trends and it gets more popularity, it gets seen more, so the crowd is sourcing it. Look, all else, what I will say is we have a problem in front of us. We know that our traditional methods of dissemination are falling behind, are not working. We found a method of dissemination. Now we have to put our heads together and figure out how to do this responsibly. The part I love most about it, of all the stuff I've talked about, the part that you asked me what I'm most excited about is that we're democratizing knowledge sharing now. It's not only coming from one hospital, it's coming from the world. I mean, we're getting, we now have the geography, it's all coming together to make a unified book, if you will, a unified source of information that's, that's crowdsourced both from the delivery of the content and the review of the content. But I don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Lisa Chamberlain, Pediatrics here. Um, I think I was thinking about there's kind of two ways to deal with the kind of keeping the filter, which is use only, you know, peer reviewed, mm -hmm. already stamped and accredited material and amplify it. Or if you're going to let the crowd decide, that'll shrink the volume down to a reasonable number that then could be accredited. 
So if you and your system created some sort of editorial board that said this one gets our stamp of approval, okay. uh, then it has a different level of having met a metric. The crowdsourced, you know, 100,000 videos or thought that these were great or whatever. And then you could say, okay, within that, we reviewed those because that would be a reasonable number to do and have some sort of stamp of, of approval. So crowd first is the first run through. And then the ones that get selected go to an editorial right. board. Right. I don't know, just some sort of metric that would say this is, you know, we index this, this one we we have vetted, we looked at the, you know, original source and and it's it's proven to be okay. Can I ask it's you one different. question about the editorial board? If you look at the editorial boards for most societies and journals, it's like, well, it used to be an old white men club, I was right? Say, That's they what look it looked like you. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's how it's always <laughs> worked. <laughs> What's that? Except for these. <laughs> right. So that's what they all look like because yeah. what happens is you get an old white guy that invites his old white guy. Right, so right. So they right. all look that way. So we're making progress in realization of that, but it's still it's still a friends club. So maybe right. there's more diversity now, but it's still, hey, buddy, you want to come yeah. join this? And so if we're going to make an editorial board, how do we make it a true representation of the world editorial mm -hmm. board without me because i still only know to call my friends that's how i do it how do i do it better yeah open call <laughs> open call and then how do we know does it matter like how do you validate someone's good to be on the editorial yeah board? you'd have to say it's certain rank or certain what's that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> but one one other thought i had and it kind of spoke a little to it what was mentioned here the idea of lazy um the idea of how do you think about critical thinking within all of this how do you think about, I don't know, I feel like a lot of my training was about learning how to think about things and learning how to really parse things out and, and analyze things. And, and I get that, that really good materials coming at a really fast rate and we're having to drink out of these you know, fire hoses and, and you're solving that problem. But is there any cost on the critical thinking side? Probably, but I'm okay with spoon feeding. This question always comes up and I'm okay with spoon feeding to get information to people's brains and we critical think somewhere else. But right now, this is debated all the time. Right now I spoon feed like crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just had a question about the platform choice that yes. you guys are using. I know like with like journals and such, like the media that's pushed out is like based on scientific and like the whole editorial board, the conversations that we've having, but like TikTok and YouTube and all these like social media platforms tend to sort of create like what's trendy and like have this whole echo chamber of like people who don't get access to some of this information. And like their whole point is to try and get, get people to stay longer. So I'm curious if you guys have thought about like, if you're using these platforms, how to get your information to people who really need it, who are in those like echo chambers that can't be reached. But I want to make sure because there's two things it's for sure an echo chamber and that's exactly what happens and i don't know how to solve that but the second thing was you said how do you reach people that need it they're not mutually exclusive so um the way that we here's how we're reaching the people that need it first of all everything we, we were originally doing was all in english now we translate it into almost everything is translated into multiple languages so we make that we were using platforms that were not like not everyone has access to Facebook. We then duplicated everything on WeChat and we were able to reach more people that way. We started putting it on every platform and then age, age is different by platform. So then we put it on all the different platforms because they're all have different demographics. So Facebook is gonna be older. And then as you go down to, I don't even know what it is. Yeah, Instagram, is it Instagram now? I don't know, but so we're trying to reach everyone. Um, and by the way, just real quick on the translation part, we, we found the, what we think the best way to do it is the video is made in one language and subtitled on the bottom so that the, that it's not excluding everyone else. So you can still have the video in one language. We're still trying to figure out how to reach the masses. By the way, 30% of our, of our network in pediatric surgery is Spanish speaking, which is interesting. I think we'll wrap up with a last question from Dr. Axelrod. <laughs> That's heavy, man. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about crowdsourcing and versus innovation. I mean, we're really into innovation here as James leads. Um, if you go to the Ox example, 
basically what happens is that the crowd regresses to a mean. There's going to be outliers, yep. but it regresses to a mean. You're smiling, so you've heard this question before. No, I love this question. This <laughs> no, is but awesome. So, yeah, so the question is, if, if we crowdsource everything, you know, we do some procedures here that for years people did not believe because we were innovating and would have been pushed to the side by a crowd. So is there a concern that somehow crowdsourcing will bring everybody to a mean and not allow progress? You just stated the question the best way I've heard it stated. And when I'll tell you the first time someone challenged that when I said that was my CEO at Cincinnati Children's. I went and met with him. I said, the crowd is always right. And he goes, no, they're not. And he goes, the crowd is right on, an, on a question that has an answer. How many jelly beans are in this jar? The crowd will get it right every single time. When it comes to innovation and creative ideas, they are not going to give you the right answer. So he pointed out to me, use the crowd. There's a great book, Wisdom of the Crowd, that talks about when the crowd is great and when the crowd is not good. And you just hit on it perfectly. You're missing the outliers. And the outliers are the ones who are going to drive the future. So it's how you use the crowd. Oh, I think that is a great wonderful question to wrap up yeah. on. Thank you, everyone, for the engagement. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Pons. Fantastic lecture. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.